Today, we sit down with Sadia, a tenacious, eloquent, brilliant young woman who has a story to tell. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of A Maven's Tale. I am joined by a special guest today. Her name is Sadia, and she is fierce, a fine, and feisty. <laughs> she is actually a friend of my sister. I wanted her to come on the show and tell her story and just basically express what she's gone through in her tender age and to actually put a face behind some stereotypes that should not be. That's the, that's the mission. We want to erase those forever. So everyone, welcome Sajia to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so as, as mentioned, I'm Sajia. I am from New York, born and raised. Um, I uh, was born, I was born in Queens. Flushing is where I grew up until I was like 10 years old. And then we moved out to Long Island, which was a culture shock in and of itself. Moving from like the most diverse place on the planet to white suburbia. Mm -hmm. But then, like, I went to school in New York, and like in Manhattan and the Bronx. Like, I really am New York through and through. My parents came here in the late '80s from Afghanistan. I'm the only member of my family born here, okay. and so I grew up first generation, product of immigrants. You know, I grew up where English is a second language spoken in my home. We speak Farsi or Persian, mm -hmm. and. It's been a whirlwind of an experience, I mean, truly, but I'm really excited to be here and talk about my life. I'm a Muslim American as well, so that's a whole other nuance to the whole discussion, being, I think, Muslim and Afghan in New York post 9-11. Um, it's, it's really been cemented, cement, like it's cemented so much of my identity and yeah. what it was, is meant for me, so. Well, I wanted, um, you actually touched on it. Yeah. But I wanted to, start off with your family origins and your family being from Afghanistan yeah. and how it was like for your family. I know that we had spoke a little bit about it before, but I want you to kind of lead that discussion. Yeah. So, you know, historically for people who don't know, you know, Afghanistan has been at the center of colonial interest for years. You know, it was specifically between, um, it really started when Britain took over because the French really, the French and the British were rivals and Napoleon really wanted to take India because India was the crown jewel of the British Empire. And Afghanistan is north of India. And since Russia was working closely with the French, there was a fear that he would like invade from the north to south. And so they were like, we need to take Afghanistan. It's a buffer state in the middle to protect India. And so the Britain took, British took over and then from there, we kicked the British out and kicked their ass, so yay. Good. Um, but then, you know, in 1979, the Soviets invade, um, the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan. Um, and that, that, is, that leads the foundation of like the emergence of the Taliban and all of this starts there because the US supports the rebel causes to fight commies. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole thing, and I could talk about that separately about like how the U.S. intervention actually led to the creation of really radical groups that then allowed 9-11 to happen and all of this type of stuff, but... Um, please, please, I, I, I actually want you to di dissect that for us because um, to some, you're speaking, not even Farsi or Persian, you're speaking like alien. They, <laughs> they have no idea what you're talking about, so I want you to get into that. Sure, um, so I can get into the history and then I guess get to my parents, but... So when the Soviets invade, of course, at this time, like in U.S. history, it is a very anti-communism, you know, thing. So the U.S. spends billions of dollars sending weapons and money to the Afghan militia that is fighting the communists, which the group was called the Mujahideen, which means the soldiers of God. Mm -hmm. And they, they sent all of this money and weapons actually through the secret, like the Secret Service Intelligence Agency of Pakistan, and they got to choose where the money was gonna go in Afghanistan. So there was no check at all. The US was like, here, you can just take it and then you, you decide where it's gonna go. But the yeah. problem is that Pakistan at the time, the democratically elected um, prime minister had just been ousted. Um, his name is Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. He had just been ousted by a military dictator. So we literally gave all of this to a military dictator. We were like, you get to choose where it gets to go in Afghanistan. And the problem is, is that 
he ended up giving it to the majority um, the majority of where the, this Pakistan Secret Service Intelligence Agency decided to give all these money and weapons was actually a minority faction of the Mujahideen, which was really radical. The majority of them were not, um, but because most of the money and weapons went to there, what ends up happening is once they get rid of the Soviets, a civil war breaks out between the rebel group itself for power. Okay. And because, you know, the, the minority at the time who were really radical, very right wing, you know, fundamentalists, so to speak, um, had access to most of this weaponry, they end up winning the Civil War, I believe in 89, mm -hmm. and they become the Taliban, and they take over Afghanistan completely. And so this is the backdrop in which my family, you know, this is where they're growing up and all of this stuff. And it's unfortunate because the Taliban or what, or, or who are the causes of 9-11 are, yeah. um, you know, wouldn't have happened without US money or aid. And the sad part is, is that we knew what was happening. We knew that the stuff were going into the wrong hands. Like a black market trade was created in Afghanistan where people were buying and selling weapons to like not combatants. Like mm. there was a drug trade that opened up there because Afghanistan is actually has a lot of opium. And one of the biggest mm. the countries that we get most of our heroin production from is from Afghanistan. And yeah. Oh, on his story and you have me. <laughs> I'm, hook, I'm hook, line, sinker. I want to uh, hear this. Yeah. And so it's funny because we knew that the majority, like about 50 or 70% of U.S. aid went to this guy named Gulbatin Akhmetyar, who's still alive, and he's like a horrible man, mm -hmm. very like fun, right wing and whatever. He was known to throw acid on the faces of women who didn't wear a scarf. Mm -hmm. And when a CIA member was asked about this, I have the articles, this is all true. Like I wrote a whole paper about this in grad school, I can tell you. Um, this is before 9-11, of course, right? When mm -hmm. a CIA official was asked about this, he literally said, fanatics fight better. They knew, they knew where all this was going. And they knew that through what happened, I mean, millions of people were displaced, millions died, like infrastructure was completely totaled. Mm -hmm. And the unfortunate thing is what made, you know, once the Soviets invaded, everything kind of like fell apart because the infrastructure completely, you know, fell apart, that didn't allow the, the after they defeated them, it didn't allow the the, 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 its own people to be able to govern properly because there was nothing left. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's just really fascinating. And then 9-11 happens and we have to rethink about our fanatics fight better comment. Mm. U.S. aid and, uh, uh, you know, intervention actually caused so much harm and destruction to so many people, even to the lives of women specifically over there. So this is a backdrop in which my family is, is, is living and being raised and all of this. And um, my parents decided to leave around the time, I think, of the Civil War. I could be wrong. But within this also, this is, I wasn't born yet. My brother, he was actually, he had cancer. He was very sick. And my, the doctors did all they could for him. He was about like 12, 13. Mm -hmm. And he really had trouble walking. He was on crutches. And they said, you have to go to India because those are the, there are better doctors, better hospitals there. Okay. So my dad went there to India with my brother and the doctors there helped him. And then they said, there's only so much we can do. You have to take him to the U.S. So my dad, and they said, you have to go to New York. So my dad came to New York with my brother through like a medical, like, I don't know if it's a visa or something. I don't know the exact details, but he was here with my brother all alone. Okay. My mom is back in Afghanistan with two girls and a new baby boy, literally. Mm. And so she's by herself and there's civil war going on. Wow. So she decides that they're going to go, they're fleeing. They flee to India for a really long time just to leave, for, to feel safe and, um, you know, to flee all of the fighting and all of the stuff going on. I mean, my sister told me a story. I remember one time when I was freaking out about like, when I freaked out about the Islamophobia in the U.S. and like all of this hatred, my, my dad and my sister are always the ones to kind of put me together because they're like, you know what, because like, I, I don't remember, but they're like, you don't know what we left. And my sister was like, I was sharing a bedroom with our aunt and there was gunfighting and stuff going on outside. And our window broke and she was above the window and um, like the glass fell on her leg and she started bleeding. And my aunt got up to help her. And as my aunt was helping her, a gunshot went into my aunt's bed. 
And if she hadn't been helping her, she oh, would have died. Oh my goodness. Oh my and my goodness. Sister, and I didn't know any of this. And she was like, that's what we left. Yeah, yeah. You know? And so it just, it's, it's perspective building. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, so my, my mom and my mom was alone in India. They were there for five years um, with my brother, my little brother, my brother now, who's 10 years older than me. He was, a, he was really young then, like almost a baby. Mm-hmm. And my sisters who went to school there, like they lived there for a long time while my dad was here in New York. You know, they, and it's so sad. My dad had nowhere to go. He had no home. He had nothing. He was like, I would sleep in the hospital. Um, I had like one pair of clothes. Wow. And he was like, I would wash them in the shower of the bathroom of the hospital. Wow. And um, my, you know, they, they really tried. My brother was actually doing a lot better. Mm-hmm. My dad was feeling really hopeful. My, my brother turns to him and says, I'm not going to make it. And he's like, oh, what are you talking no. about? He's like, no, you are. And he was like, I'm not. And literally within days, he had a fever and he ended up passing at like 14 years old, which is heartbreaking. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you. Um, and so I, I never met him. I mean, it was way before my time or when I think I was ever thought of, but it's heartbreaking, you know? And my dad, I remember, this is, this is, the, this is the extraordinary kindness of strangers. He had nowhere to go. Mm-hmm. He had no home. And he would be on like the streets and there was this woman, this really old lady who lived in Queens, who took him in. Like, I remember seeing these pictures of my dad and like next to a Christmas tree. We're Muslim. We don't celebrate Christmas. Yeah, like, so I was like, what, what is that? Mm-hmm. What is that? And he was like, oh, this, this, this really old lady who lived by herself. She took me in when I had nowhere to go. Wow. And so he stayed with her. And like to the day that she's now passed, yeah. my dad would visit her all the time, giving her food and bread and all of these types of things just to stay connected with her. But my dad had to bury my brother all by himself, which is, I can't even imagine what that's like. And he didn't have the heart to tell my mom. So it's, I mean, this is, my parents' story is out of a movie. It's actually insane. But my, my mom really was, she was alone with children without her husband. I mean, she was mentally not okay. She just wanted to see her son. Yeah. So goes to the Indian American embassy and she says, I want a visa to visit my sick, my sick son. Mm-hmm. And they like give her the name and they, she gives them their name and everything like that. And they tell her, you're lying. Your son died on this day. And that's how she wow. found it. Wow. And I mean, she was like, she was wow. so heartbroken is an understatement. She was a mess, but it barred her from being able to get a visa to come to the US because they're like, you're lying, you know, all of this. And it was horrible. My mom was by herself. And my dad decided to stay. He bought a business. He bought a deli, um, literally on Amsterdam Avenue, Manhattan. And he was like, I'm going to stay and get my residency and everything like that, my permanent my green card. And then I'm going to, get, I'm going to sponsor you guys to come. Mm-hmm. We're going to do this the right way. And my dad did, was here for a couple of years. And he had a brother. His brother lived in New Jersey would come here from Afghanistan before him. But I mean, he wasn't that helpful from what I've heard from, you know, from uh, from family stories. But thing is my mom after five years was like, I can't do this anymore. I can't, I'm not, I can't do this anymore. I'm not good at being a single parent. Yeah. She was like, I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah. So she was like really depressed. She was struggling a lot. Mm -hmm. And so she, my dad is like, okay, fine. So he flew back to India and they're like, we need to think of a new plan. And they couldn't come back to the US. So they did the thing that almost all refugees do, right? They can't go back to Afghanistan and find papers, right? There's war going on. Yeah. So they bought fake papers mm-hmm. um, and they decided to go to Canada. That was the plan. And they had like fake, they were ironically Israeli passports and they flew, they had multiple transits before they got to Montreal. And we had family in Canada at the time. So one of my cousins was, was, was ready to go pick them up. Their last transit was in JFK. And the guy looks at my dad. And at the time, my sister says there was some political thing going on. I think she said the Iranian hostage crisis, but that can't be right because that was in 79. But there was something going on. Mm-hmm. So there was extra security. And pretty much they got caught. They're like, my dad, they're like, you from Israel, do you speak Hebrew? And my dad's like, no, I speak Arabic. And they're like, well, can you speak Arabic? My dad couldn't. And 
So pretty much they got caught and they were jailed in New York. And the way that works is the airline takes full responsibility for putting passengers with not proper papers on. Mm-hmm. So my, my, and my mom's with like a child, like you literally two kids. So they're, they're imprisoned at a hotel. Okay. They can't leave anywhere. But my dad would have to spend a couple of nights in jail. And my brother tells it though. He's like, we had immigration officers follow us around. So he was like, it was actually so great. We got to eat at the hotel restaurant. They paid for it. We got to like go upstairs. We had room service. They paid for it. I mean, like they were, wow. my, my brother's telling of it is really funny. Yeah. But my dad had to spend some nights in jail and then we had to figure it out and get an attorney. And I don't even know if we got an attorney, you know, cause this is all before my time. But pretty much, you know, we were like, we can't go back. There's war and all of this. And this is why we fled and we're refugees. And so they were granted temporary, temporary asylum in the U.S. Mm-hmm. So we were here. So that's, that's the story. And my dad went back to the deli and he was working there. And then I was born. Um, by the time I was born, they had sold the deli and all that kind of stuff. Okay. And we were in Queens and, you know, but then while I was like four, three, four years old, my dad got a notice of deportation and they were going to be deported. And so we had to get an attorney and, and work that out. And I, I remember this day very, very, very clearly. And no one believes me. I was four. I remember I wore a little red dress. I didn't really understand what was going on. Mm-hmm. We were going to court. And my sister was holding my hand and she said, today's the day that we, that they tell us if we get to stay here. And she, and I was like, I, I was a four. I was like, oh, uh-huh, la di da di da. Um, and we, and we went to court and I remember, well, from what my sister tells me, the judge himself was a product of immigrants. And so he granted my parents permanent asylum in the United States. And so that is the story of how they got here and stayed here. And I, I just think it's very interesting. You know, we were supposed to go to Canada and I think, I think we were meant to be here because my brother's here. Isn't that the crazy thing? Wow. That was the only cemetery that would do Muslim burials. So my dad had to bury him there. And we've just moved closer mm-hmm. as time has gone on. So I think in the universe or something, there was something that we were meant to be here. And I wouldn't be anywhere else. I, I mean, I love so. New York. I think so. I think that was yeah, more that's, divinely, that's the story. divinely inspired. Yeah. But that, that's, that's rough, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. And because of the fact that, you know, Obviously, you live in America. You live in Trump America. And you know about the migrant detention centers and what those children and those families, what do you think about the detention centers and how Trump is basically preying on people's ignorance? What do you think about that? How do you feel about that? It's inhumane. It's inhumane. People are fighting for their freedom. I mean, the, just the, also the audacity that some people think, well, if they're going to do it, they should do it right. Yeah. You think people could, they wouldn't? You think they want to do it this way? Yeah. You think my parents wanted to do it this way? Yeah. Like, are you, it's just like, the, like, it's just crazy. I used to work, I, I interned at a senator's office and the things people would say on the phone, I would have to take up the phone and people would be like, listen, I don't, I don't hate them. But like, if they're not doing it the right way, then why are they coming at all? And I'm just like, oh my god like these people are literally they have no other choice it is yeah. life or, or death um it's it's horrible these detention centers i mean you hear these stories about them they're unclean people are not like especially mothers with children are not getting access to the neat the resources they need diapers formula and need- just women period and what we go through as women right you know, if you catch my drift, right, you know, right, what right. we go through as women uh, on a monthly basis and not having the proper hygiene access. Absolutely. Think, just think about it. You know, it's just, it's crazy. Every time I, I, I hear a story or even when Corona came about, the first thing I thought about was the people in the migrant camps. It's spreading. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's horrible because you're in prison for wanting to be free. Yeah. And that's the horrible part of it. And we can do better. You know, a lot of, there's some politicians who believe in ICE and say, it can work. ICE is, I fundamentally believe a terrorist organization. I don't think that ICE works at all. I mean, I remember when Trump won, 
I was working at a university and, you know, kids would come up to me crying and saying, kids with undocumented parents, you know, there's ice patrolling on my street. Yeah. And I'm really worried about my, my family, you know, ice agents just getting on buses and asking people like their immigration. I mean, these things that are actually against the law, yeah. but trying to find ways to arrest people. Yeah. You know, I have seen videos of people being tackled at airports like, I mean, horrible, horrible things. It's just horrible. I mean, with the, the wall and the detention and the children, I mean, like, that's the thing. Children, like, out of, out of any population that we should be protecting, it's children. Yeah. It's heartbreaking. And I, I remember reading about lawyers trying to connect the children back with their families. And one, some of these children don't speak English. Yeah. Two, some and of them are losing really their documents. Right. And some are so young. Yeah. So like, how can you get this? So like they're asking them to draw so they can somewhat figure out who their, I mean, parents are. It's heartbreaking. Horrible. It's, it's really horrible. horrible. It's heartbreaking. It's all of the above. But the fact that your parents had enough tenacious vigor, you know, in a, because your mom doing it by herself, that was one thing. Then your dad, coming over with your brother, having to bury his son by himself, you know, and then going through the whole process of trying to get to your family's house in Canada, the, the immigration, what, what, what do they call the police? Immigration police or whatever. Mm -hmm. not, not ICE, because ICE wasn't the one that were, were following your parents around. I don't think so, no. Okay. But having to go through that process and then still being able to survive, still being able to, you know, be successful in whatever they do. That is, people say that, you know, other people come over here for the American dream. And I'm just like, mm. and this does not make me unpatriotic. <laughs> it makes me aware, you know what I mean? The American dream has not yet been fulfilled. It's um, still it's still yet to be seen and to be accomplished. But what what even is that, right? You can't you can't have that without sacrifices. I mean, so my dad has a master's degree and he is a driver. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that at all. And my dad is so smart. I mean, I would be learning things in school and he would be able to have conversations with me about the science and the politics and the agriculture and the statistics, but he can't use any of his degrees here. It doesn't count, you know? There's, mm -hmm. there's all of these sacra, like even the privilege to dream. I mean, my dad, my mom, they just, they're, I don't know if they're dreaming. They're trying to survive. They don't have the privilege of dreaming. You know, they don't have that's a sound bite. That's a bar right there. <laughs> the privilege to dream, girl. I felt that all in my spirit. <laughs> and I, I mean, I, oh, that they, got me. Mm. But they do it so their kids can, you know. I mean, that's Ooh. that's that's the thing. And it's it's sad. I mean, I see the sacrifices my parents had to make along the way. It's I mean, coming to a new place where you don't know the language, you don't know anyone. I mean, you don't know how to go about, you don't, you don't even know where the grocery store is, yeah. let alone like how to communicate with people. And it's different. I mean, this is all post 9-11. Things really change after that. I mean, the laws got stricter. My dad's still not a U.S. citizen because of really discriminatory laws that have okay. to do with our immigration policy. It's really messed up. Mm -hmm. It took my mom and my siblings 20 years because of our case, because they came here illegally and they got caught and blah, blah, blah. So it took them 20 years for them to become citizens. It was, we've been fighting legal battles since I have been four years old. We have had an immigration attorney since I have been four years old. It is the way we've been fighting. They do it so we can survive. I mean, that's the thing. The privilege to dream. That was deep. Yeah, was what deep. is the American dream? Right? That, got, that, that got me. And I hear I thought I had bars. Girl, that's <laughs> that was the biggest bar. <laughs> Seriously, growing up post 9-11 in a country that has a lot of Islamophobia. Yep. Um, 
how was that for you? It changed my life. It's, it's this event. It changed the way I, I have to navigate the world, how I introduce myself, how I keep my like my blinkers on. I mean, now as I've gotten older, it's easier for me. I'm very like confident in my identity and whatnot. But growing up, especially growing up in a place where no one looked like me too, you know, I went from, again, like I grew up, I went to school most of my life on Long Island and it was really scary because I, and I'm very lucky in comparison to other family members, other stories I've heard from friends where like people have actually said things to them. My cousin, she wore, she wore a scarf sometimes during the year and it would be pulled down from her head. People would call her Saddam because not only is it post 9-11, but it's the Iraq war. So yes. both of these things are happening simultaneously. I remember in school, if your name was Muhammad Osama, pretty much Osama or, or Saddam, you, you got made fun of. They were snickering, all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, my brother got into something in high school because he was in high school when it happened. I was 10. And I, I, I was 10 years old. I remember it very clearly. But I didn't know. I found out much later that he, there was issues at school because of it. And he had bomb threats every week going on and all of this. But, you know, I know that my uncles and my, and I'm sure even my dad, and he hasn't said this, you know, yeah. people say things to them when they're in the city. So much of my uncles are, you know, they have little, they're the, the little, little um, coffee trucks, you know, in, in Manhattan where they sell oh. coffee and bagels and stuff. And they have so many times people have said things to them, you know, online on Twitter, you know, if I even tweet anything and I'm not even tweeting at anybody, but anything remotely against Islamophobia people come at me. I've been called a terrorist. I have been called all of these things online. Like it's actually crazy. And I find it, I'm at a place now where I find it comical because oh, I'm like, yeah. Oh yeah. And I'm like, you don't even know who I am. Mm -hmm. I didn't even like contact you and you have gone out of your way to go online and find me and then make this accusation. Like, do you got some, you got some priorities you need to check out. Like seriously. Yeah, those Twitter, those thumb thugs. I those know. Thumb thugs. What I like to do is I like to like retweet it. Cause I'm like, if you want to, you want, you wanted to say this and put this out in the universe, I'm going to amplify this. Show hate. everybody who, ex who exactly you are. I, I do that girl. High five. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I do the same thing. I get so much of it all the time. It's like, so it's a lot. I'm used to it on social media. I get it a lot. When I was interning um, at the Senator's office, I was there when there was a, a, a terrorist attack. I think it was the one in New York city. Mm -hmm. There was one, I think it was the one in like the financial district. I think it was the guy with the car. Oh, this was a few years ago. Was that a few years ago? Or two, maybe two years. Ago? Yeah. Two years ago. Two years ago. Yeah. yeah. I was on the phone with this guy who had to be from the South because of his accent. And he was saying some really messed up things. Mm -hmm. And he was like, yeah, people are talking about some of the look at these people. Like they're like, they're so they're terrorists and all this. And I told him, I was like, sir, I'm Muslim. And he was like, Oh, well, I'm sure you're one of the good ones. Don't you love hearing that? And then started asking me all these questions about the hijab and all these things. I was like, I am not here to entertain racists today. Mm -hmm. you know but I I took it as much as I could and I you know and my my boss was like you know you did not have to talk to him at this point I'm I'm used to it because yeah. I live my entire life in this like defense mechanism mode where you know my parents said to me say that one more time I want you to say that one more time defense mechanism mode yes my parents said to me at a very young age I was 12 they said you know when people ask you where you're from because of course you get that question all the time mm -hmm. where are you from Long Island. No, no, no. Where are you really from? Um, my mom's womb. You know, it's like, <laughs> like people, people want to know what country you're from, right? Yeah, yeah. Automatically. Yeah, and yeah. Sometimes I get, when did you get here? Which I love because it's like, I don't even have the privilege of being born here. I was like, when did I get, like people assume I, I came here anyway. But my parents said to me, when people ask where you're from, you know, you say America, right? You were born here. You don't say you're from Afghanistan. I mean, my parents, and the sad part is, and this isn't post 9-11, I said to them, I already knew that. You didn't even need to tell me. I knew that that is not something you say. As a young kid, I just, it's amazing how young we are. We understand the complexities of race without even being able to have the language for it. I knew, like, I knew I wasn't white 
when I went to school because I'm the lightest in my family. So everyone told me I was white my entire life. And then I went to school and I knew immediately I wasn't white, but I knew being white was good. I knew that. Oh. I knew that. I knew that the, the white box was the box you wanted to check off. Check. Woo! And I spent a lot of my life, you know, I think because I spent a lot going around white people, mm -hmm. trying to, I always was 10 steps behind and I never could figure it out. I was trying so hard to be like them, talk like them, walk like them. And I was like, there's some manual I missed. I don't know what's, what, I don't get it. And now yeah. I know. Mm -hmm. You know, because I have the retrospect and the language, but at the time I really didn't. So it was, it was tough feeling so on the outside of things. And then also feeling like I had to constantly have my meters up. Like I remember when we moved to Long Island, I'm a big reader. I love the library. I was as a kid too, but I would be on I wouldn't be able to tell from all those books behind you. <laughs> um, but I would be uncomfortable going to the library because I think I thought the librarians didn't like me. I mean, I'm like, what, 14? And I couldn't, I could, if you asked me why, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you. I would have been like, I just feel like they don't like me. So question, do you think that it made you grow up faster than you needed to? Absolutely. Or than you were supposed to? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, also I think being first generation daughter of immigrants, I had to do all my paperwork. I had to do all my stuff. I was the one that had to bring my parents, be like, here's a permission slip for this thing. It's for this, this, and this. Can you just put your signature over here? I mean, that was my life. Yeah. I, I, I didn't have the privilege of like, my parents handling all of these things. I had to handle it. I had to remind them, parent-teacher conferences on this day. Are you guys coming? You know, like I was, you have to take the reins of a lot of these things because English was a second language for my parents. And even for my mom, my mom, you know, she, she speaks well, but it's broken and still. And so I had to take her to doc, even from a young age, I had to be at her doctor's appointments. I had to, when we traveled, I traveled with her. You yeah. know, I was the one that like, this is our gate, mom. This is our flight number. You know, now she's an amazing traveler and she can travel on her own. But, you know, I had to kind of leave my parents sometimes, you know, yeah. in, in so many instances. So I had to grow up very quickly. And I don't think, I don't think people get that side of things. They don't understand that part of the oh. big picture. You know, they just see a family and they just see not like us. When I was in college, because I went to school in Manhattan, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I dormed, but I would go almost every weekend. And my roommate said to me, my roommate was from Massachusetts. She was a white woman and she's very sweet. But we all have our blind spots. And she said to me, why do you go home so much? And I was like, oh, my parents need me to do this. And I have to read this for them. And I mean, sometimes my dad, even though he speaks English very well, if he gets like paperwork from like the bank or something, those are things that even I with a master's degree don't get sometimes. Can you imagine my dad? He's like, can you, what is, what are they saying? You know? And so I was like, they need help. I have to take my mom to the doctor and all of this. And she said to me, I don't get it. Why, they, why can't they just do it? And I was like, because they can't, they don't like, they haven't been here forever. Yeah. You know, yeah. like this is, you know, so it's, it's just interesting. The things that people don't see or don't get. Because it's not in their, it's not in their best interest to learn. So they would rather just stay ignorant to whatever it is. Right. So being that you have, Seg well, you are a good segwayer for me. <laughs> we need you to be a co-host. Um, you were talking about the fact that you were the lightest in your family. Since you're the lightest one in your family, I wanted to speak on you are American, but your heritage from your of your family is from Afghanistan. I am American. My parents are American. My grandparents, Jamaican, um, Native American, and the list goes on and on, right? So obviously, I'm not as light as you, but you're lighter than your parents. However, when we see each other, there is colorism within our own demographic 
and between each other. The POCs of the world, or should I say the people of color of the world, there's colorism. It's real. Um, I don't even know where to begin. It's interesting. I think a lot of it has to do with, I mean, this is how power permeates, right? I think it really has to do with colonialism and the British. And whiteness is revered in Afghani culture. You find that in, I think, all, not only South and Central Asian culture, but even in East Asian culture as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it has to do with, like, who the people in power, what they look like, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what the thing is. And even my other friends who were, you know, Indian, they would be like, I don't want to get tan. I hate going outside. I don't want to get any darker. You know, all of these things. Really? And, oh, yeah. And, you know, I have family members who say to me to this day, that color looks so much better on you because you're lighter, like nail polish or lipstick. And I'm like, that's a false, that's falsity. Like, that's not true. I don't know if that's a word, but I'm like, that's, are you kidding? Like, but it's so internalized. Yeah. Like, I remember the fair and lovely creams, right? Like all of that stuff growing up, mm -hmm. all of it. And I, you know, sometimes I used to get mistaken for other cultures. Like uh, people would always assume I was Indian. Growing up, I would get offended and I didn't know why. It took a while for me to realize what it was. And I was like, it's because I assume that Indians are darker than me. And I had a realization where I had internalized this racism, right? Where I was like, oh my God. I mean, it's so, sometimes it's so subconscious that you have to, this is what the work of anti-racism is, right? It's unlearning every single day. Like we are all a part of it. Like no one is born racist. Yes. It is all taught. Even from like, as I said, as a young kid, I knew white was good. Like it's, it's so quick. It's so quick how quickly people see race, how people see color and all of that. But it's still there in, in our societies and in our cultures. You see it um, color. I mean, like even in some communities, people will make comments about certain people in certain neighborhoods. Well, it's not a good neighborhood because people look a certain way in that neighborhood. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. Can we take a step back and unpack that? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Let's unpack that. You got too much in your suitcase. Let's unpack it. Right. And it's sad because so much of it is cultural. Yeah. It's not religious. You know, in Islam, diversity, inclusion is so, it, like, it's so sad when culture trumps your faith and people, and then people confuse the two yeah. all the time. And they're like, well, this isn't, I'm like, no. Yes. Yes. But um, it's, t it's hard. I mean, I, I talked about this before is a lot of POCs who are not black always think sometimes they can use the N-word because they're POCs. Mm -hmm. And I have to be like, we can't, we can't use that word. And sometimes I have to have this conversation with family and, you know, I get the, well, they use it in rap songs. I'm like, okay, the rapper is black. Are you? <laughs> And, you know, some of them say, you know, I have black friends and I say it in front of them. And I'm like, I don't, then I don't know about that. But other people, I'm like, I promise you, if you wouldn't say it in front of a black person, you should not be using it. But I, and here's the thing. And people are like, well, I don't get it. It should be fine. It's just slang. And I'm like, no. If the community affected by it tells you this thing is offensive, just don't do it. I don't get why there has to be a follow-up conversation. Yeah. Like, if I say to someone something they said is Islamophobic, mm -hmm. they can't argue with me. Yeah. There's, like, you don't have the right to decide what the oppression is. Yes, exactly. But it's, I, not a, it's not a choice. It's not a, um, a B, C, D, E. It's not multiple choice. It's one answer, and that's it. Not a choice, no. You're not passing but, that test. Colorism is real. I was trying a conversation with my mom. You know, and I was like, wait, mom, do you know the history of this country? Because again, they came here and she, I was like, because we were talking about George Floyd and everything. Uh -huh. and I was like, you know, people were, black people were enslaved. And she didn't know, I mean, like all of this. And she was like, wow, what's going on? And, you know, my parents, I, I'm very fortunate. My, lucky, my family seems to be on the right side of things and they understand everything. And they're like, this is horrible. But having context is so important. And so many, depending on your community and where you're from, they didn't know. My mom, you know, she only has a high school education. My mom still can't read or write, but she's one of the brightest people I know. And so it, it's what makes her story even harder for me. Yeah. My mom has such extraordinary potential. She was married really young. 
She had kids really young. Mm -hmm. She spent most of her time taking care of them alone. You know, she, she was fascinated to learn about all of this stuff. And she was like, really? Human being? I was like, yes. That's the history of this country. But the fact that you even take the time out to teach them, like, look, this is what has gone on. And the education system within the United States is yeah. geared around white. Yep. Yeah. It Absolutely. doesn't really give room for the other. The fact that even white women were considered a minority <laughs> up until, I don't, um, it was the women's movement. The fact that the only people that were uh, the majority were white men. White landowning men. Yes. But then you have the school system and the curriculum that they teach our, our children that only gives ear or light to the white experience. Yep. Yeah, they may. We just started celebrating Muslim holidays. I know. Within the school system in New York. Yep. I know. Just a few, what, maybe a few years ago. I am used to not seeing my family on our holidays. I'm used to having to go to school. I'm used to having to go to work. People don't have to do that for their Christmas and other holidays, right? But like, I have always been used to having no I mean I'm not a place where I don't compromise anymore and yeah. I'm like my holiday bye yeah. but um you know growing up that was the status quo I, I had a moment where I realized can you imagine like the stores being closed and, like school being off and everyone being able to celebrate together mm -hmm. what is that like that's amazing yeah. you know but yeah you're right so tell us what a Muslim woman is? Ooh, that's a layered question because I think there's, there's so many different types of women. There's a one type of women. So they are, I mean, from stories of in the Quran, you know, they are fierce and powerful and strong. Modesty is a part of it, which I think is a big conversation, right? Um, with the hijab and staying covered and everything. And the reason isn't to oppress. I mean, and that's what a lot of white feminists will tell you. Mm -hmm. um, it, the idea of being modest and how you dress is that you are not commodified by society. Mm -hmm. The point is, is that you are, when you, when people talk to you, when people are interested in you, they are for who you are mm -hmm. and not by what you look like. Yeah. Um, and so that is the essence of it because the essence of the whole modesty aspect of it. But it's not just covering your hair. I think that's the one thing about hijab is, and the term hijab has to do with how you are as a person, staying modest as a human being and your interactions with one another and how you talk to one another, how you carry yourself. It's not just a scarf on a head. It's a way of being. Um, you know, a Muslim woman, it's, women are revered. There is um, a saying of the prophet that says that one pious woman is the equivalent of 70 pious men. Mm. And there's a, a famous line that says that heaven lies beneath the feet of your mother. And My so, brother says that all the time. It's true. <laughs> Paradise lies at the feet of the mother all the time. All the time. I mean, I don't blame them. I mean, I've seen my, I have two nieces and I've seen what childbirth does to people. And I'm like, okay, I get it. I get it. I get it. And the sacrifices that they make for a child. Mm -hmm. Muslim women are really strong, and a lot of them who do wear a scarf, I mean, people say this now all the time, they are warriors, because right now they are ambassadors of a faith, and they put themselves at a higher risk of being attacked, teased, verbally abused, mm -hmm. all of these things. Mm -hmm. And some women still go around and do it. You know, I, I struggled with wearing a scarf my entire life. It is something I've struggled with and I've wanted to do, but I never felt like I could, and I felt weight by society, and all of this stuff and, and I, a part of me feels really guilty about it. I struggled a lot. I tried and you know, I tried, I wore it sometimes here and there and things like that. And I was never happy. And I was like that. I, I, I wouldn't want to go outside because really? of what people do. And which was, I feel guilty even caring about what people thought, but 
I said to myself, I shouldn't wear it if I'm afraid to walk outside with it. And I wear it when I go to the mosque, I wear it when I pray, you know, here and there and stuff like that. But I think growing up for me, the Islamophobia really hit me really hard because in 2011, that was, it was the 10 year anniversary of 9-11. I was in high school at the time. And that was the time where I had decided to take this faith for myself. You know, I grew up Muslim, you know, my parents are Muslim, but I did have a moment where I was like, if I'm going to be this thing, I need to like know what this thing is and take it for myself. Yeah. So I did the research, right? I read the Quran, I, I read the, the English translation. I, I did all the research on it and I fell in love with this thing. And I was like this, I want to be Muslim. This is my thing. Mm-hmm. So I was finding this identity at a time when at the 10 year anniversary, I remember the statistics, Islamophobia was more rampant in 2011 than it was in 2001. At that time, there was that guy in Florida who was burning Qurans. While this was happening, there was a whole controversy over the Ground Zero Mosque. I mean, so there was all of this stuff going on on, on, on TV and everything while I was finally like really identifying myself as, as Muslim. And it was really hard for me. I was really scared. I was like, the whole world is attacking us. You know, I, yeah. there would be hate crimes and all of this stuff. And I was afraid to go outside and I was so young. And that was when my parents were, had tried to whip me into shape. And my dad was like, my dad, the, the immigrant, right? He was like, as long as you have a law and a constitution, you have the freedom of religion, you will be safe and protected. And I was like, I know, but I, I don't know. I was just so affected by it. I was like, I'm scared to go outside. I'm scared what people will say. I'm scared what people will say if I tell them I'm Muslim. I'm, you know, I was terrified. I wouldn't eat. I wouldn't sleep. You know, it was really, really, yeah, I was really, it was, it was, I really struggled a lot at the time. You know, I think because it was just everywhere, everywhere. There was some other thing happening at the time. There was all these protests against uh, the, the, the mosque going on there was all these people speaking on CNN all the time and all of this. And like, it was, I, I struggled with it a lot. I don't blame you. So what about the divide that we have between people of color? It's so real. I mean, it's even between the Muslim community itself, you find it. Mm-hmm. Sometimes people refer to mosques by ethnicity. That's the Paki Mosque. It's cra- crazy. That's the Afghani Mosque. I mean, the mosque I grew up with is all Afghans. It's this, it's, and I, I mean, the beautiful thing is about it, it's the same mosque I've been going to since I've been a kid. My parents know everyone. They've known each other for decades. But everyone there is Afghan, right? And there is a mosque, and like people will say, those are all Pakistanis, and that's a Bengali mosque, and that's an air. I mean, like, it's crazy. And it's just like, we shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, and yeah. We all should be coming together, and sometimes the sermons, which are called khutbas, um, in our mosque, are said only in Farsi. But there's like Arabs and other people there who have no idea what's being said. Yeah. So it's just it's it's ridiculous. It's it's so real. Um, people make judgments about the religiosity of an ethnicity completely. Mm-hmm. You know, and then you also have converts you know, white Muslims, and then you have, you know, and then if we're not, if we're not just talking about Muslims, you know, in our communities, right, like, racism is a real problem in, 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 in non-black POC communities, 100%. You definitely see it in the Muslim cultural communities all the time. I mean, George Floyd, the grocery store he was in, the people were Muslim, they were Arab. I know, you know? I know, I know. And so we need to do the work within our own communities ourselves. It doesn't stop. I think we absolve ourselves sometimes by thinking we're in this group, we're people of color together, but it's like, but even within that group, there are layers, right? You know, we are not as oppressed as our black brethren. We are not, Mm -hmm. you know, imagine you you can say, oh, I'm Muslim. Well, what if you're Muslim and black? That's a whole other layer. Yeah. So it's, that's the tough part. And I think so many people are not willing or it's tough to get to, I think, some older folks who are stuck in backward thinking and a lot of these things, but it's something we really have to grapple with in our own communities as well. I think one of my biggest issues is that people equate Muslim with terrorists. Yeah. But the majority of the atrocities that have happened in this particular country 
have all been by Christian, quote unquote, Christian men. Right. The KKK is full of churchgoers. What about that? I forget the guy's name, um, but he, the, the church in, the black church in the South, the young white Oh, people. um, I forgot his name, but I won't even say his name because he's, <laughs> you know. He's not important to remember, but like most of the shooters, active shooters are white men. Yeah. But they're not considered terrorists. If That's they, if they, what I was getting to. <laughs> if they're not considered terror, then who is? But they get the privilege of some mental health problem. Yes. Their home life. They yes. They were really as a kid. They were really bullied. But Sandy if- Hook. I know you were around for Sandy Hook. You were yeah. old enough to know during Sandy Hook. When those children, they're, they're, they're my son's age. Those children were gunned down by a white male in Connecticut. And they're just like, oh. He's just, I mean, and the first person he killed was his mother. We know that there are extremists on every level. And we just have to make sure that we ring that bell and we say as loud as we possibly can that this isn't okay. And it's up to us to instill in our children and our children's children, this is how you move. Terrorism you know? isn't defined by identity, you know? It's That's not. The thing. If, if we're going to play this game, as I, as I say to people all the time, then, you know, sometimes the, the one that happened in, oh my God, there's so many shootings, they blend in. <laughs> the one that happened in like, um, was it Texas? The one who wanted to kill immigrants. It was like at a was, supermarket or something. In, a, in the Walmart. Yeah. And yeah. so he was an anti-Trump, so he was a pro-Trump supporter, right? Yeah. There was a shooting in the Montreal mosque. He was a Trump supporter. The shooting in New Zealand, in the mosque there, right? Trump support. So many, but like, does this mean all Trump supporters are shooters and killers? If all Muslims are terrorists and all Trump supporters are murderers, you know what I mean like the same logic exists? Yes, that's true. It's 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 just really funny, and you see the difference in reporting, right? You see it depending on what the person looked like in their ethnicity. Mm-hmm. Automatically, it's like what they're called is different. Lone gunner, lone shooter, or terrorist. Yeah. yeah. You get the full life story of the person if they are white and all of this and how they had a difficult child and difficult upbringing. If they're a different color, it's like they were radicalized. They are yeah. you know, a different story. It's absolutely a different story. Agreed. As far as your, your life, your parents' life and how you were raised and how you are moving now, I say bravo. Oh, thank you. I say bravo. Your parents did one heck of a job raising one heck of a young lady. Thank you. You want to tell them? <laughs> <laughs> they think I'm a hot mess. I am so grateful that you did this with me today. Well, I'm I really loved it. Thank you for having me. You know, wow. I mean, like I was able to talk throughout some things that I feel like I needed to even hear out, out loud and I, it's it's been really enlightening and you know you talking about the erasure of our of our history that's something I'm really passionate about it's it's what I, I studied and talking about like our education systems and what is missing and what is lacking which just further perpetuates you know oppression and racism because people one people don't understand that racism is systemic exactly they literally just not liking a, a black person and it's like well it's more complicated than that um, and I didn't, I didn't learn about systemic racism until I went to college, but who has the privilege of a college education? Not everyone yeah. does, right? It's a whole thing. Recently, I had learning about like the amount of lynchings that went on in this country and all of this. I learned that lynchings happened during reconstruction. Yeah. Maybe post war once or twice. That was it. Whoa, wait a minute. This was like almost every day. Yeah. And it went on for a long time. At least you have a trace to go back to, to know where your family is from. I had to do a 23 in me <laughs> to find out where my DNA goes back to. Like a lot of people that were killed or even brought over in ships, like who knows their name? Who knows, you know, they don't have a name. They're just unknown. There's so many unknown graves in America from slaves, who knows, where their extended family, you know what I mean? 
Right. So it's, it's atrocious what America has done. And for you to speak out about it, then you're unpatriotic or you're not for this country. If you don't like it, then you can go back to where you came from. No, boo boo. I came from here. Dissent is patriotic. This very country was founded on speaking your mind and criticizing the government that existed. Exactly. Come on, British uh, colonialism experts. <laughs> so I was so I was so shocked. Just to sidebar for a second, that Meghan uh, Markle and Prince Harry came out the other day and were just like, "Atone for your sins." Yes. He's changing that family, man. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> she came in and was just like, I'm going to kick this door down and y'all going to see me in all my blackness. <laughs> you know? I, I love it. Because I'm here for it. The Brits did a lot of harm. They did a lot of shit. If anyone, oh, yeah. if anyone does Empire, they do Empire. But like, whoa, they got a lot to atone for. They're amazing. But even like you, the unknown names, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I really realized how atrocious this all was when I visited the EGI in Georgia. Uh -huh. And the monument, there's a monument of peace and justice for all the lynching victims. And you, and you can say now, and I fully agree, what happened to George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Aubrey, they're, they're lynchings. Yeah. They're still lynchings today. Modern day. Yeah. The amount of unknown names, that in and of itself is an erasure, right? Like the intellectual almost colonialism, right? The way that we even understand ourselves is flawed and imbued with power. And that's how it perpetuates itself, right? Like even the way knowledge is understood and produced is complicit in oppression. Mm. And that's because we constantly have to do the work all the time. Yeah. Because who gets to write our history, right? It's the people that won. Yes. It's always from the, the victor's right. lens. Never Here's from the victim. The I, I, I could talk about this for 17 hours and not <laughs> even take a bathroom break. I'm so <laughs> serious. Because it, it, it is a passion of mine as well. So I'm saying if you and I are out here and then, you know, we have other people that are out here that's ringing that bell, ringing that alarm, Beyonce style, you know, then somebody has to listen. These laws need to be changed around, including immigration laws. Because how are you going to take over somebody's land and then say who comes in after you? But that's another story. I'm not, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to, I'm not going to. I'm not going to get on my soapbox. One person at a time. One mind at a time. Change is slow. Change is slow, but it's necessary. Amen. Amen. Stay tuned for scenes from the next episode of A Maven's Tale. And I was just like, what is your problem? Like, I went off on her. Like, and she was like, oh my God. I was just like, yo, do you realize you going to say that to the right one? Not even the wrong one, the right, the right one. one. Don't forget to subscribe.